Okay, so I guess we can start. Um, so welcome and thank you all for joining us. You can hear me now? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, my name is Lulut Stoller, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the program director at Jeff and Israel. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to have Jeff and SVF and Task Force to work together and bring this shared interest to all of our members. We're also very happy and grateful that Alan Divak, director of the Lee Tower Foundation, an active member of all of these organizations, will be moderating this webinar. Thank you, Alan. Um, just a few, a few uh, opening words. As most of you know, since the first day of the um, COVID-19 crisis, the Jeff Fan team is in touch with the nonprofit sector, the government of Israel, and the funders community. And we found that there is a real need for accurate, uh, for accurate and up-to-date information about the needs in the field, um, as well as a place for discussion about the potential role of philanthropy, such as the discussion that we will have tonight um, in various social uh, fields um, that are being affected from this crisis. And therefore, uh, in the past weeks, we have gathered the data and information for funders backed by a series of webinars for AIM uh, to aim and provide you uh, the most relevant content and information uh, from the people on the ground and enable an effective philanthropic discussion. Um, so tonight we want to dedicate the next hour and 15 minutes uh, to the issue of Israel's Arab society and the COVID-19 emergency response. And just before we'll start, um, I want to um, pass the mic to Liron Shoham, Executive, Executive Director of Task Force, uh, the interagency of Israel-Arab issues to say her opening words and then to Ellen, you know, we could continue to our uh, meeting tonight. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ru. thank you everyone. Just a quick word of welcome and thank you to the partners, speakers and participants, uh, especially in Israel where it is late and just after the Iftar meal. Um, I think one of the silver linings in this whole strange period is the tighter cooperation among organizations that we see in the field. And um, this is also reflected here between the task force, uh, Jewish Funders Network and Social Venture Fund to create uh, learning opportunities about uh, the crisis in Israel's Arab society. Um, towards that end, I just wanna say that the task force produced a briefing paper on the status and response to the crisis in Arab society. And I will put the link uh, to the paper in the chat. Some of you may have already gotten it. If not, um, it is available uh, here to everyone. And um, I'll be available in Q&A if there are any questions. Uh, about this resource. Thank you. And Alan, please. I was muted. So thank you, Ruud. Thank you, Laron. Um, first, I want to wish a blessed Ramadan to all who celebrate and to especially thank our, our Muslim participants uh, for taking time from either their fast if they're in the U.S. or from what I hope is a, a busy but socially distant family celebration uh, to join us now. Uh, and as I said, I'm Alan Divak. I'm program director of the Litauer Foundation based in New York City. I'm also co-chair of the Social Venture Fund for Jewish Arab Equality and Shared Society, uh, which is a giving circle of American and Israeli donors. It includes foundations, federations, and individuals. Um, one of Litauer's ma main areas of funding is access to opportunity and social mobility for members of marginalized groups in both New York and in Israel. And this is uh, what, how we started to fund an Arab society and how we got involved in the SBF. Uh, we came to see that if you love Israel and you want it to be a strong and thriving democracy, you can't ignore the needs of 21% of its population. Now, many of you I know are already investing in Arab society, and I commend you for it, and many have made tremendous contributions. I'd like to welcome the rest of you to consider this, uh, and also perhaps to take a, consider taking a seat at the Social Venture Fund table. Uh, speaking personally, uh, this, the SVF has been one of the most satisfying parts of my work. I've gotten to know a circle of exceptional uh, donors and grantees, and also uh, have found a way that my rather small foundation can have a positive impact on the lives of hundreds of thousands of Israelis. Now, the COVID-19 crisis uh, maps onto existing challenges affecting weak populations everywhere. 
And in Israel, the Arab population faces significant socioeconomic gaps. It has the highest poverty rates, and Arab municipalities are amongst the weakest or the weakest in the state. Now, funders in Arab, people who fund in Arab society have watched uh, with a sense of real dread as the public health and economic crises have progressed over the past weeks and months. And while the economic impacts have been and will continue to be very severe for Arab citizens, the health impacts have been somewhat less dire, and at least so far. We're not out of the woods yet. But what progress we have made in this area, I think, is due in part to the work of uh, people who you will hear from on this call and to many others like them working very hard in Israel. So first we'll hear from three activists from the Arab community, uh, Professor Nehaya Daoud of the Department of Public Health, Ben Gurion University. Uh, she's a member of the Higher Follow-Up Committee on Public Health and also a member and former chair of the Ministry of Health's National Committee to Advance Public Health. She'll discuss gaps in social and healthcare services uh, during the crisis. Uh, then we'll hear from Ahmad Al Sheikh, executive director of Gal uh, executive director of the Galilee Society, uh, which is an NGO based in Shvaram and focuses on health, and which houses the Hamal, the National Situation Room for Arab communities in the north in responding to the COVID crisis. Uh, after that, we will hear from Khair al-Baz, board chair of Ajik, a leading NGO in the Negev, and he'll talk about the situation room and, in fact, the entire situation uh, in the Negev. And, and after, a, a, after these uh, speakers, we'll also hear philanthropic perspectives from Adina Shapiro, uh, board member of the Bader Philanthropies and the Mubadarat Foundation, and Bacha Kalas, who's our Israel director at, at, at the SVF. We'll conclude with Q&A. So just a few logistical words. We have a lot of learning to pack into 75 minutes, and we know that we're only scratching the surface. So it's going to be my dubious honor to have to remind all of the speakers to keep to the, their allotted times, and I'll send them reminders when we, we reach it. If you have questions, please enter them using the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, and then use the chat for cross-discussion. Although we're not going to come to Q&A until the end, uh, post your questions as soon as you wish, and please identify yourself and your affiliation when you do so. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Daoud to present for 10 minutes. Go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for organizing this uh, uh, important uh, meeting. Um, so I will start with the general and then talk about the, our experience in the Arab society uh, in Israel. So first, we know that the coronavirus has challenged, uh, you know, the healthcare systems around the world, and uh, you know, it revealed um, weak preparedness in many countries for, uh, you know. Um, uh, dealing with such a pandemic, and uh, it revealed also inequalities in health in many countries. We see that the corona starts with the, low, the high socioeconomic status populations, and we see that uh, it's um, increasing in uh, low socioeconomic populations, and also the severe cases are really uh, concentrated uh, more in these uh, populations. In Israel, um, uh, while the coronavirus now is at, uh, decreasing in the Jewish uh, population uh, countrywide, and uh, we see that uh, there are uh, more and more release uh, regarding, you know, the instructions of the Ministry of Health, it is increasing in the Arab uh, society. Uh, we see this increase uh, started uh, uh, from last uh, uh, March, uh, 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 yes, late March, sorry. And uh, now it is uh, still increasing in many um, localities. It's actually now uh, around four times uh, more in the Arab uh, localities uh, uh, than the Jewish uh, localities. We see um, uh, at the beginning of this crisis, uh, we really um, thought that the Arab society is going to be at risk 
for um, the spread of the coronavirus because of two reasons. One is that, the, as the Alan mentioned before, the Arab society has lost its economic status in many uh, localities, villages, and towns. And uh, we thought that it, uh, um, these localities will be less able to protect their populations uh, from the coronavirus uh, spread um, because of lack of um, services uh, and others. And uh, we know that the Arab society also um, has um, higher um, chronic uh, diseases, uh, um, cancer, and then um, you know, uh, lung cancer especially, which is relevant for coronavirus and also in other chronic diseases. Uh, so we thought that this population will be at risk for um, the spread of the coronavirus. Um, and uh, at, the beginning, at the beginning of this uh, crisis, we identified uh, actually three types of gaps uh, in, in, in relation to um, corona in the Arab society in Israel. The first gap was about uh, providing information about the, um, the coronavirus and how the population can protect, um, the Arab population can protect itself from the corona, the coronavirus. The information did it arrive at the beginning in Arabic language and um, for almost uh, three weeks, people were looking for this information and it was not there. The second gap that we identified was related to the healthcare services, the emergency healthcare services, which was about, you know, um, a, the MAGA services um, and uh, the tests. We identified a, a large gap regarding the tests. Only 1% of the Arab population uh, was tested at the beginning of the crisis. Um, and this was the second gap we, uh, we actually identified. So the provision of the healthcare services regarding the emergency uh, was a, a really a, a another gap that we uh, identified. We found out that the emergency, emergency services in the Arab localities was a, actually a, a, a private now, and um, it, it happened for many years, but now we identified uh, this uh, really because of the uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, the third gap that we identified was related to the uh, data about the patients and the epidemiological investigations. We found out that, you know, um, at the beginning of the crisis, that there was no data about our Arab patients. Uh, the epidemiological investigations that were uh, published uh, by the Minister of Health didn't include Arab patients. So we started actually um, uh, Highlighting these gaps, we actually um, recognize these gaps and um, uh, we, uh, the follow-up committee uh, of, for health in the Arab society in Israel. Um, and um, uh, so we identified these gaps, we um, suggested solutions, and then we started to talk with the Minister of Health and other agencies in Israel about uh, these gaps. We found a very important um, uh, thing that the uh, Arab population is not involved in the decision making for uh, the higher emergency um, uh, team that has actually dealt with the uh, corona. Uh, the Arab population is about 20% of the population, but they are not uh, part of uh, these things of the emergency. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, the needs of the Arab society were not included uh, and were not considered actually uh, for uh, the solutions that were provided uh, for the general population. So uh, for now, we see still that there are gaps regarding the data about patients and also epidemiological um, investigation that are coming late still. Uh, for example, uh, we now need to know if the schools um, uh, should be back to, you know, um, uh, uh, usual um, opening and, uh, you know, uh, uh, back to school. Uh, we can't make this decision because we still uh, don't know uh, and don't have any data about uh, um, the coronavirus stratified by age. We don't know how many children in the Arab society were uh, infected by corona. 
if we know this information, it will be easier for us to decide uh, about uh, getting back to schools uh, about children uh, from different ages. Um, so uh, this data is lacking. Um, we know that, um, you know, in the Ministry of Health, the uh, decision making um, was um, at, at different levels at, um, at the coronavirus uh, crisis, but uh, uh, there, were, there are almost no Arabs at the decision making level in the Ministry of Health. There are many Arabs around, you know, um, maybe 25% uh, who work uh, at the at different positions in the hospitals in the front line actually of dealing with Corona. But uh, I think they are not quite uh, going back home because of the situation in the Arab uh, localities uh, currently. Another example is regarded with the Ramadan. Uh, the Minister of Health decided uh, a week ago that uh, you know um, there are going to be uh, release uh, instructions for uh, people to come back to work. Uh, but uh, this decision came exactly when the Ramadan started. And uh, we thought that if this decision was two days or three days later, maybe it will be easier because everyone now started thinking, okay, there is um, a decrease in Corona nationwide and uh, the instructions are about to release. So everyone in the Arab society is thinking, okay, we should also release uh, the instructions while we see that the Corona is increasing. So uh, for these reasons, we, we think that um, it's uh, important to include the, the Arab population, uh, maybe specialists or, um, or um, other stakeholders in the, the level of decision making about the, the crisis of Corona. And I think we should also take some lessons that we need to learn here about emergency situations in Israel, because normally, Emergency is, is in Israel is uh, for security situations. And now we have health crisis. It's not a security situation. So in this case, we need actually teams uh, of specialists, multi-sectorial uh, uh, specialists that are coming from different fields, from health, from education, social work, economists who can work together in order to consider the needs of the different uh, groups of populations. Because we see not just, the Arab, uh, not just the Arab society was left behind in this crisis, also other uh, uh, marginalized groups were also left behind. I think the Haredi is another example. Uh, older uh, age populations, also another example. So if we want to learn from this, uh, crisis, I think it's uh, really very important to include multi-sectorial teams that can work together in order to, to provide solutions for different groups of the population, specifically now that we are talking about releasing and uh, uh, turning back to work. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much and for a timely and informative presentation. Um, uh, next, I'd like to call on Ahmed al-Sheikh of the Galilee Society, who's going to talk to us about the very important work of the Hamal, the Situation Room. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, to give us the chance to describe the situation of the Arab population in Israel. Uh, First of all, I want to say something about the Galilee Society. My name is Ahmad Sheikh. I'm the general director of the Galilee Society. And uh, first of all, in the Galilee Society, we have five different uh, centers. The Environmental Justice Center, the Health Rights Center, uh, uh, the Rikas Socioeconomic Research Center, uh, the Institute for Applied Research, the R&D, and the Science Education Center. Uh, as you see here in the, uh, in the uh, you can see the, that uh, the emergency situation room for Arab society are a cooperation between many different uh, uh, NGOs in the fields. You see here the Galilee Society, Musawa Center, South Islamic Movement Charitable, uh, Injaz Center, Adala, Sikui, 
Amanina Women Against Violence, the follow-up committee uh, on education, AGIC, uh, LAM Center, the National Council on Health. So, purpose, why, why to have an Arab emergency situation room? Uh, an Arab uh, society situation room, Hamal, has been established with the aim of providing a professional and unified resource for treatment of events, risk, and disaster that occur or may, may occur in the Arab society in all areas. The purpose of the Hamal is to support local authorities and to coordinate the connection with the government. Uh, reasons why we need it. Uh, over the year, we suffer from prolongate inequality uh, in government orientation towards Arab society affairs, uh, need of uh, society, uh, socially uh, tailored treatment and immediate intervention. As you know, we are not part of Israel's crisis management platform, and we are not included in decision-making platform in general. Uh, time of the essence. We saw that the, the chaos in the Arab society in the first weeks uh, with the corona and the lack of a minimum basic information in the Arab community. So uh, our structure of, or how we work, we have staff in the Hamal, 10 employees and the civil society representative. Uh, we have 10 committee, uh, uh, committees per issues area as example, food security, health, local authorities, education, information, employment, emergency room. Uh, and we have expert round tables from uh, civil society and others. We are uh, connected with the Mashlat, central government, uh, government uh, bodies. Our activities is to collect information needs from local authorities from the field from partners and from a WhatsApp group and social media. Uh, we make uh, prior, uh, prioritize and develop recommendation, develop solution, per pursue with government authorities and delegate the relevant organization. And uh, we, are, uh, we make monitor performance. Each task has a status, it will change with the time. The challenge, the key challenge is local authorities. Uh, as you know, all Arab local authorities are weak and before finance crisis. In addition, the match of income from uh, property tax are known. Emergency uh, committees, it's very urgent to have functioning local emergency committee, uh, evaluation of local emergency committee uh, preparedness. A survey was conducted on the preparedness of the local, local uh, centers. <clears throat> Business and employment, we expect that 30 to 40 percentage of small business will not be able to open again. In addition, uh, the unemployment rate, it's uh, expand and it's now in Israel 27 percentage. We uh, see that it's increased in the Arab, locally Arab community to 45 percentage in the Arab community. Education, now we discuss back to school, if not learning from distance, what about BTA needs for the households? Uh, we conduct a survey and we, uh, our, and our estim estimation around 100,000 uh, pieces needed for uh, households. Uh, health and welfare, testing and isolation, and uh, food security, elderly people, domestic violence. We, uh, we say that the uh, violence inside the family are increased in, uh, in the last uh, weeks. Information on uh, adherence to guidelines. Ramadan, we know a whole month of um, <coughs> maintaining a distance while the rest of the Israel is being to be relaxed in the next time. Revenue streams, that's uh, local authorities uh, allocated of em emergency budget of uh, to uh, Arab local authorities. A request has been submitted to the internal ministry and a budget was approved. 
Uh, another request has been submitted to allocate an additional budget emergency budgeting. Uh, budget for campaigning. We uh, a request for a budget for public campaigning, uh, local public campaigning, raising awareness and information in the Arab communities. Budget approved. The amount rank from 50 to 100,000 new shekel uh, depends on the size of the localities. Uh, the emergency preparedness uh, and a guide uh, for establishing a local emergency center has been prepared, distributed, and offered help if needed. Another guide for setting up and running volunteer groups in the community has been prepared, prepared and thus distributed. And the volunteer network guide. Uh, follow-up and field uh, visits. We visit in many different uh, localities and see what's happened uh, in really in the localities. Uh, publication of health information. We have a new Facebook uh, website, a uh, Facebook site, which publish uh, awareness and information about health situation. In field or in issues of health prevention, inclusion and access, uh, information and awareness testing sites. We know at the beginning it was, as uh, Dr. Nihaya mentioned, it was uh, around one percentage. Now we are by uh, 13 percentage of, uh, of uh, the total tests in Israel in the Arab community. Uh, isolation uh, accommodation for patients and uh, individual and isolated individual. At the beginning, it was big problem with these issues. We arrange, we monitoring the uh, evacuation and accommodation process and helping local authorities coordinate with the National Control uh, Center, Mashlat. The, we design a plan for loca uh, locating and uh, prepare, uh, prepare, uh, preparing hotels for isolation. The plan has been co communicated uh, uh, to the uh, marshal. Uh, epidemiolog epidemiological investigation and uh, patient routes uh, approached the health ministry in the uh, regards. Involved of Arab experts in the crisis decision-making process, we see that last uh, the last time Dr. Bshara or Professor Bshara Bshara is part of the health ministry staff. Uh, the problem of Nazareth Hospital and advocacy uh, we see that uh, Mifala Pais has proved a budget of 20 million new uh, Israel shekel for hospitals. Hospitals in Nazareth were not included. We send a message and we uh, success to uh, move 1 million to the uh, uh, in, um, Austrian uh, hospitals. Ramadan. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to change uh, behavior and habits in the Ramadan, a public campaign has been launched and uh, published. Uh, Ramadan prayers and sort re religious figures involvement in decision-making process regarding the mosque closer. Uh, uh, assessing the need for food package research need, uh, uh, an assessment of needs was submitted to the Ministry of Interior Affairs and Ministry of Welfare. A budget of 30 million was approved for distribution of 60,000 voucher to family. Next week, it will be begin. Uh, Ramadan instruction for local authorities. We publish instruction for local uh, authorities and distribute it to all local authorities. Uh, at the same time, instruction for business in coordinate with national heads of our uh, of Arab local authorities and the mashlat. Uh, the decision was make made to close businesses from 18 to three hours. Now preparing recommendation to close from uh, 19 to 22 hours. You see here what addressed uh, now. Uh, at the end, I want to, to, to add that the, the Negev emergency room, uh, it's, it's established with the Negev room in uh, Abutlul with Ajik and uh, Bedouin local authorities. Uh, other, other things I talk about this and what being addressed in the next time, Ramadan and the holidays, uh, property taxation compensation and re, uh, reopening the school, voucher distribution, 
uh, uh, what I talked before, three, 30 million uh, vouchers, business and economy governmental assist package, public awareness instruction for closing business and distribution computers to the school. Uh, and the next time, for the next time, we think that we can continue to work on poverty and, and, and unemployment, uh, the education problem, the loss assessments and expenditure for, uh, in the local authorities, uh, crime and violence, uh, catastrophe scenarios. We think about to make scenarios about different uh, catastrophe that we can uh, plan uh, and be prepared for, for this and the uh, post-corona treatments and uh, the volunteering network in the Arab community. Uh, our vision to improve emergency preparedness and coordination for Arab society identifies and represented, uh, represents, represents needs for Arab localities, uh, serve as an on ongoing resource to government authorities. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Just one question came in for, from uh, Near Bums that may be of interest to other people on the call, which is, uh, what's the relationship between the Hamal and the National Situation Room at Tel HaShomer, which also has an Arab desk? Uh, we have, how, how are you all working together? Yeah, we have deeply connection with uh, Ayman Saif. I mean, Ayman Saif was uh, an uh, uh, our uh, buddy or our man in the mashlat. Uh, every day we talk uh, many times and uh, give him the, the, the uh, needs and uh, Ayman help us to, 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 uh, to, to fix the needs and to give us the answer. Uh, we are in, in deeply cooperation with Ayman Saif. Excellent, okay. And one other question has come in and maybe you could explain this a little bit, I'm not sure. Uh, if everyone on the call is familiar with sort of the Arnona, the tax disparities between Arab municipalities and Jewish municipalities, and how that may play out in this crisis. Look, uh, at the last uh, week, we, we, we say that the government uh, spent uh, 2.8 billion uh, shekel for uh, taxes for the local authorities. Uh, at the end, the Arab local authorities uh, have only 1.7 percentage from the total number. It's uh, among 47 million. It's uh, lesser than what all Arab localities, lesser than what Ilat uh, receive from this money. It's not fair to have to split or to give only one percentage for from uh, three million, uh, three billions uh, only for the Arab localities, which we are more as 20 percentage in the community. Great. Okay. Thank you very it's much. only for and business, yeah. uh, business Arnona. Great. Yes. Okay. Right. And it is, so, so people know, right, the, the business real estate tax, the commercial taxes are what fund most municipalities, right? And Arab municipalities collect money. Yeah, exactly. But it's not fair. It's over the time we don't have industry uh, zone in the Arab localities, and we don't have the chance to build the uh, industrial uh, zone and the uh, industrial income uh, as Arnona. And at the end, the government came and say, we give uh, the Arnona a, a part for, for each locality as a part of uh, conventional uh, Arnona. And it's not fair. We, we receive only 1.7 percentage. You, you know, it's lesser than, than, than Moshav near uh, it's mushab or misgab or something. Uh, which, you know, it's right. So it's not, not structural correct. disparities that you know are particularly dire at a time like this. Great. Okay. So so thank you. And now um, I'd like to call on Khair uh, Abaz from Ajik to tell us a bit about the situation in the Negev. I'm going to unmute you. It's not working now. Uh, now it's working. Go ahead, Khair. Thank you. Uh, salam, shalom, tov, uh, everybody. It's very nice to be with you all the, this evening. And uh, um, it's so good to see so many people supporting us going through this, uh, these crises and very difficult times. So thank you so much. Um, dealing with the Bedouin community in the South, um, you, Alan, mentioned, and other, my friends also mentioned, the um, socioeconomic situation and the Arab society in general and 
And in the Bedouin community, it's, as you all know, it's a lot more difficult. During the, the normal life, uh, the socioeconomic is so hard that uh, we were hit hard by this, by this crisis because the infrastructure is so poor uh, and about 50% of the community doesn't even have the basic uh, uh, ways of dealing with such, such crisis. Um, running water, roads, uh, all the other infrastructure, health and, and uh, educational infrastructures are so poor. So what does not work in, in normal uh, life does not work in crisis. And that was uh, uh, what made it very difficult. Uh, what I will try to do within the next uh, 10 minutes or so, which is a very difficult task, it's even uh, more difficult than dealing with the corona crisis, to put all the work that have been done uh, in the last month or so within 10 minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, so what I will try to do is give just an overview, very short overview, of the current situation in the Bedouin community, then maybe mentioning some examples of things that we have been doing in the last uh, a uh, month or so as an NGO. Um, and uh, the third part will be looking uh, towards the future. How can we use all this huge uh, quantity of knowledge that was accumulated in the last month or so in dealing with crisis? How can we use that to build a model of intervention in the future? Uh, keeping in mind that this is the first time that the Bedouin community had to deal directly with crisis. Uh, using its own resources, uh, like NGOs and like local authorities uh, and local professionals. Uh, usually we relied heavily on the state. We usually we relied heavily on the front uh, command to deal with the, with the, the crisis within the Bedouin community and during wars and, and other crises. But this is the first time that we're taking a leading role in, the, in, in, in providing the services during crisis. So that's, that's a very important experience. Uh, what we, uh, uh, when, when that crisis started, we noticed that, as usual, the Bedouin community did not believe that it's going to hit the Bedouin community. As China is so far away, and it's not going to reach us. So, at first week or ten days, people did not behave according to the uh, what were they expected to behave. They did not follow the Ministry of Health actual recommendations and regulations. And we have seen that people were just going around and not believing that's going to happen. So our main focus at the beginning was how can we deal with the, with the crisis in terms of increasing awareness within the community. Uh, and we immediately realized that because of lack of um, past experiences and on the part of all the different parts uh, and, and, and partners, like the municipalities and other civil society organizations, the first reaction was how can we get together around one table and start synchronizing our work and working together towards facing this, this major crisis. So the first step that uh, we initiated was how can we get everybody to work together? And that was a very serious challenge. Um, the Hamal is, is the result, but to get to the Hamal, we had to do a lot of work to work with all the different partners, convincing them that by working together, we would first achieve a lot more and secondly, everybody will have something to do because this is, this is a major, major crisis. Uh, it's not just within the Bedouin community, it's national wide, it's worldwide. But every, everybody is busy in dealing with this crisis in their area and our area needs to be dealt with by getting a partnership that everybody will have to uh, you know, do something uh, and work together. So that was our, our, first, uh, our first step, is how to get everybody uh, around one table we did a lot of work and some of the partners that are here in this meeting helped us doing that. And uh, we started the Hamal in Abu Tlul, it was mentioned by Ahmed earlier. Uh, while in this Hamal we have uh, more than 25 uh, different organizations and partners sitting at around the same, you know, same table and, and uh, synchronizing the work. So we have the, uh, in, in the first stage, as I said, the, the awareness required us to first of all work with the religious uh, leaders with the masks. Uh, keep in mind that the first week the masks were open, uh, or the markets were open, the, the um, uh, cafes were open, everything, everything was open. So we needed to work with the religious people, with community leaders, with the local municipalities, with business people to close all these uh, uh, businesses. So the result was after about a week or 10 days that all these businesses were closed. And trust me when I say that closing a mask for prayers or closing a supermarket or cafes, that wasn't an easy task, but it was done because everybody was there. 
all the different partners were saying and doing the same thing is to convince the community that this is, this is for their own best. Um, so it, it happened. So the first week, first 10 days, things started rolling towards uh, high awareness. And after about two weeks from the beginning of the, the Corona crisis, um, the awareness was at, at, the, at the most, at, at the top. Uh, everything was closed and the masks, even during Fridays, were closed. And to do so, we needed a lot of uh, support from religious leaders. Uh, so we formed our, our uh, Imams Forum, that's actually in operation for three years now, helped us tremendously to reach out to the community. And the credibility was mainly because of that, because the religious people approached the people and said, you know, this is serious. Uh, uh, please, you know, work together to, to prevent it. Um, so that was, that was one important thing. The other thing was to include, and I would like to practice my computer skills now trying to put um, uh, uh, my presentation just for you to see some of the pictures because we wanted to bring reality into you, into this room. Um, so let me see if, if it's working. So just to show you some of the things that have been done. Uh, the second, the second um, uh, challenge was how to get people to work while maintaining their safety as well. We had prepared within a very short period of time, with, with, with two, three days, we prepared 300 volunteers. Those are volunteers on the, uh, the normal life that we're working with. And within three, four days, they were all ready, 300 volunteers, young volunteers, ready to get involved immediately. We had to go through the official sort of uh, documentations for this. Uh, keep in mind that there, there were some regulations that prevented people from moving from one place to another. So we had to do that documentation to get them ready to move and help us. So the 300 volunteers, that was the first step to, to prepare. The second one is to mobilize resources to uh, start phase two in terms of providing people with uh, means to protect themselves, the communities themselves. So we started raising funds from different organizations, from government offices, from local municipalities, business people, to raise funds uh, to purchase uh, masks and gloves and all the other uh, uh, materials that need to be, you know, need, uh, that people need to protect themselves. And we started by our volunteers to uh, actually uh, uh, give these materials to the, to the communities. Uh, just to give you an example, we uh, actually um, uh, gave about uh, 50, even more 50,000 uh, masks, about 40,000 gloves and, and a lot of uh, 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 other materials uh, like the, the uh, hygiene, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, preventative, uh, whatever materials that people use to prevent themselves from being affected. Uh, and that was actually given away in a few days. So the second phase of following that was how to start giving people food. And we were able within a very first short period of time get organized and just to give you uh, a sense by looking at this picture, volunteers were preparing uh, packages of food that were delivered to thousands of packages of food that were delivered to the community. And this is a picture from the nearby Hamal uh, that we started in Abu Tlul, uh, just packaging before they start spreading the food uh, to the communities. The third uh, uh, challenge was how can we also help in terms of entertaining people uh, and mainly kids. And you can see the, some of the examples here that we actually worked, our volunteers worked in the communities to provide them with some sort of recreational activities. And for that, we also gave thousands of uh, non-formal education kits that, uh, kids that were given to the children uh, and helping the parents to uh, actually work with their kids. So here you see the, the volunteers, the Ajik volunteers are actually in different places and different uh, 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 areas. That's the, uh, uh, the, the one on the left, my left, is when uh, the food that was raised from uh, supermarkets and from other uh, uh, local businesses and were given to needy uh, families. Uh, here again, some pictures of, about our recreational activities. Um, uh, also, in terms of increasing awareness, you see, well, this is one of the, the Algeek volunteers actually stopping cars on the roads and explaining, giving them written materials, giving them some, some uh, advice of how to protect themselves and how to remain home and uh, uh, take care of themselves. Uh, this is the logo of the uh, the, the uh, Abu Tlul Hamal. Uh, around this table, as I said, there are about more than 25 different organizations, including uh, 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 um, government representatives, including local authorities, NGOs, uh, private businesses, uh, of course, a lot of the civil society organizations that you are all familiar with, 
uh, were working together uh, uh, on this Hamal. And the uh, Hamal responsibility was basically to gather all the information on a daily basis. And uh, uh, this information was, was put on, 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 on uh, 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 lists and that was, was provided to government offices, to the home front, to all the uh, uh, organizations that were providing uh, financial support. So on the one hand, we were able to gather the needs, and on the other hand, we were able to also uh, generate some funds to meet these needs. So the Hamal was working every day from morning till night, uh, first of all, uh, collecting information, and secondly, getting all the support that comes in and of the volunteers were in charge of spreading all the, or, or, or distributing all the uh, uh, food and other products that were uh, uh, in the Hamal at that day. So it was a daily, daily, uh, um, very important work. And just to show you, this is also some pictures from uh, the uh, non-formal education materials that we were, you can see that all the, the other different materials that were used to put in boxes and, and give the people. Um, the Hamal is here. You can see the Hamal and the, uh, this is a small building there. Um, and you see Ayman Saif, his name was mentioned. Ayman Saif was appointed to be the person in charge uh, of the crisis uh, on the part of the government. So he was there visiting uh, and working with all the different uh, leaders. These leaders also included the uh, doctors association, the Bedouin doctor association that working with us on a daily basis. There are about 200, 250 doctors that are, were there to support, provide information, provide health in cases uh, of emergency and all the other services that are required in such crisis. Um, again, um, the third, and the most important party that we actually started working with, and which is the first time that happened, is working in great partnership with the police and with the home front. Uh, the picture on the right side, my right side, is the uh, district, uh, I think they, 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 they I'm translating now, the district commander of the police uh, that were visiting and also we're in contact on a daily basis with them to find the best way to increase awareness, but on the other hand, to also implement the regulations with maximum sensitivity. Not to say that we're always uh, successful, but at least by doing this work together, we were, over, we were able to prevent a lot of, I would say, conflicts and clashes on, on the, on the uh, communities, between the communities and the, and the police. Um, this is, uh, again, the left side uh, um, uh, picture is uh, one of the soldiers of the home front working with our uh, uh, Hamal director, Ilan. Uh, and by the way, let me just uh, uh, throw one, one thing here that's very important. The Hamal was run by Jewish and by Arab uh, staff. And it was located in one of the Bedouin towns. So that's for us also creating the shared space that will allow us in the future maybe to, to take this model and, and, and make it a, a permanent model. And the middle picture you see another, uh, uh, soldier from the home front, and uh, for those who know the the, the uh, local scene, uh, will be amazed. Uh, the local uh, home front is working with the Islamic movement to uh, um, to give food packages. The guy on the right with the with the white shirt is one of the local Islamic movement leaders, and he is standing just across from the home front soldier. So for us, it's not something that it's we take for granted. Uh, just to just to mention, uh, they were thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Kerry. This is really amazing and inspiring. Uh, again, just 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 a quick question, a quick uh, uh, picture here, and let me just give me thirty seconds to okay, talk great. About the future. Um, again, these are, are, are all the photos of uh, Ayman Saif again with all the mayors and with all the representatives, the official representatives, providing the the uh, 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 information. And let me just, for 30 seconds, to give a quick uh, look at the future, what's we, what we're expected to do in the future. Uh, and, and also let me also thank in this, in this uh, meeting, thank the JDC. Uh, they did a lot of work in terms of helping us also connect with all the different organizations and with all the different future fund, you know, with, with, the, with, the, with the funders and with other organizations, government offices and other. So the JDC did a lot of uh, very important work. Uh, the future is how can we take the challenge for the future is how, how do we take this huge amount of knowledge and experience that was accumulated within one month and make it a permanent model that will allow us in the future to be involved as local communities, as local leaders, 
on, on crisis, not just the corona crisis, but also wars, God forbid, uh, natural you know, crisis and, 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 and other kinds of crises. How can we use this information and knowledge and make it accessible to people in the future? And how to uh, also get back to work. We did all this work with 30% of our staff because the 70% of our staff for the first, uh, after the first week of the crisis were actually uh, on, a, on a unpaid leave. And now our challenge is to get them back to work and, and cover all their expenses. And the third one is how can we help the communities that were affected highly by the unemployment, increasing unemployment that happened in the, re in the recent weeks. So how can we help them in terms of supporting the local small businesses and all the other uh, people who were affected by the uh, major uh, unemployment that uh, increased tremendously. The challenge is Ramadan now. How can we in Ramadan make sure that people are getting the next wave is a lot worse because what people are unemployed for two months now and now we will have to, will have to give a lot of support in providing more food more baby food and products within the next several weeks. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Khair. This was a fascinating and really inspiring story. And I know Pro Professor, uh, Professor Drood has a brief comment she would like to make before we turn to our philanthropic colleagues. So I'm going to unmute you for a comment. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I think. Um, 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 in response to the question of uh, what can help uh, in, um, in the case of um, um, in our community um, to deal with the coronavirus or to pass this crisis, I think there are a few um, suggestions here that can actually uh, help. Uh, first, I think um, uh, transparency is very important regarding the data, you know, um, I'm an epidemiologist, and we need this data uh, for decision making. It's crucial. We need to know the number of children that you know um, have uh, uh, the virus, and also all the adults that have the virus, and what are the severe cases. So uh, we can make better decisions in order to really um, uh, uh, um, um, help our community. Uh, to deal with the virus in the different uh, uh, localities. This is one thing. The other thing that is related to what uh, Kher was saying before, um, I think uh, solidarity with the Arab community is very important here because the Arab uh, community they didn't have the virus at the beginning of this crisis for one month maybe. And it, was, uh, it showed solidarity with the with the Jewish uh, population by staying at home while we didn't have really any numbers of coronavirus. Now we expect this solidarity also during the Ramadan months where people are staying for the third month now and they need to stay for the third month at home. It's very difficult for our community because uh, about 50% of the Arab population are really uh, working in minimal wages. They are workers. They don't have really a salary that can they can get it while they are staying home. So it's very difficult for many families now. We saw some very difficult case, cases now. Uh, so we need this solidarity. We need uh, the government to be more uh, intervening in um, you know uh, helping the different families uh, going through this crisis. And what Khair was showing us and what Ahmed was showing us is very beautiful, but it is largely depending on the NGOs in the different, the different NGOs, uh, Jewish and Arab NGOs working in the Arab community. I think uh, that uh, uh, there should be more intervention by the government in this case. I think uh, I talked about the uh, partnership and engagement in policy making. It's very important. Not uh, as you know, a cliche or something like that. It's important because we need um, uh, uh, we need uh, our needs to be considered in the different decision making processes that the government is taking now, especially in these uh, days, because the government is talking about releasing you know the instructions and making you know the, the going back to normal life. So it's very important to do this. And the last thing, you know, in public health, we believe in health in all policies. And health in all policies is about bringing 
different uh, specialists to the table to discuss, you know, uh, the issue of uh, tackling the different aspects of the coronavirus because the coronavirus started as health crisis and now we see that it is uh, becoming an economic crisis and it is affecting many aspects of life. It's a social and economic because we see that violence against women is increasing but we don't see uh, many solutions coming to confront this violence. We see that many families now are staying at home and they have uh, really uh, financial difficulties. So what are the solutions that are coming to these families while they are staying at home? So this is, this is becoming really um, more social and economic crisis, not just health. And it shows, you know, these interactions between the different fields, how important economy for health and how economic health is important for economy and for, uh, for uh, social life. Okay, thank, so, you. Uh, thank you, Nahaya. Some excellent points and we'll continue at the end. We will have more time for discussion. So now for a philanthropic uh, perspective, I'd like to call first on uh, Adino Shapiro of Bader and Mubadarat for seven minutes. Adina, please. Hi, thank you, Alan. And, and thank you to, uh, to all of the speakers uh, for, for sharing their thoughts and especially for, for the work that you've been doing. I, um, I'll just, I'll, I'll start out by saying many people have spoken about the aspects of, of, this, uh, of this time as being a time to learn humility. And, and we have a lot to learn from it. Two things that I might point out in, in this, uh, in the context of the Arab society in Israel. One is that you know, I've always felt that, uh, that as, as a Jewish uh, Israeli involved in, in supporting and helping the Arab community in Israel, I'm actually contributing to the entire Israeli population that's a part of the building the resilience. And I think there's nothing more um, uh, expressive than this time and, and the health and how really the efforts that you are doing within the Arab communities serve the entire Israeli population because there are no borders here. So that, that very much illustrates that, that point and, and it's something we can take from it. And, and another point is that, um, is, is that it's always, uh, you know, it, it, it's easy to say, but it's not always easy to feel what it's like to be a minority or to be a, 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 you know, a, a weakened, um, a, a weaker population. And, and so I think that as someone who grew up as a majority um, in, in, in the state of Israel, and, uh, and also maybe you know, coming from, from a place of privilege and being able to, to contribute, sometimes we don't always internalize uh, what it means to have restrictions on you. And this is a time that definitely teaches all of us what it means to feel restricted more. So I hope it's something that we can take from us as, as, we, move, uh, as we move forward and, and think so this, this is one of the things that, that I'm taking um, from it. Now, in, in terms of uh, a, a philanthropic perspective, for, for these aspects, I, and I think I have mainly questions of things that, that we're, we're looking at um, together also with, with, the, um, with the Mubadarat team of, of, uh, of uh, three women that have been very helpful to me at, the, at this time. Um, is, one is helping identify what are the needs where we as a philanthropic community can assist. When, this, when the Hamal started and the Situation Rooms began and, and we had the privilege of, of being a part of this, one of the things is, was definitely to create the collaborations with the government, with the Mashlat, with the Central Room. But then the, for us as a philanthropic community, we have you know, our ability to help is very different than that of the, of the, of the government. And it, we, need to, I think, continue to engage in conversations for how that goodwill and willingness can be utilized. Just to say some of the things that, that uh, the philanthropic community sometimes can do better, right, than the government is to be quicker, to do some trial and error of things that uh, we're not sure if they work or not, to be more flexible, and we're still always smaller than the government. And sometimes though we have the, the ability to, um, to leverage our grants against the government and to, to affect 
um, to affect. So uh, I, I would say use us, but it's also our responsibility from the philanthropic community to, to help not just hear what the general broad, broad needs are. For example, you know, we speak about education or distance learning and their needs for, for tens of thousands of, of computers and for training teachers and everything, but also to say from those needs, there are certain things, not only do we expect the government to, uh, to do, but we probably can't do as a, a, alone. So where are those places that we can intervene and be helpful at, at a time like this. So that, that's one of the things that, that's, that's very much on, on, on my mind. Um, and another thing, which is also something, and I think uh, it, it was also touched upon earlier, is that uh, these uh, situation rooms came up in a time of emergency. And our grants were emergency grants that were based on trust that was built with the civil society over years. It wasn't a proposal, and we didn't do the diligence, I'm sorry to say that, you know, would be done in, in, in uh, normal times, and more it was us saying, we have trust in you that are working on the ground, and just go for it and start, and, and we're there. And, and I think that that's very important, but then the question is also, you know, how do we deal with these type of emergency grants? How do we then assess whether it was successful or not? Um, you know, what 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 is the um, uh, what is the collaboration between us and and the grantees so that we can assess moving forward and perhaps come up at, at another time for similar types of needs? So that that's something that that we're also looking for, and and it's important for us to hear from uh, from our partners, which also brings me to looking to the day after because the day after what's been created here through the situation rooms, both uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the north and the south, as, as we say, and is, uh, is very much looking at, uh, at immediate needs and, and for short term. And there are many things that can be taken long term. I think Khera spoke about that as well. And that would be something that, that we're looking at to see how do we take that in, not just in an emergency situation, but looking at it now carefully, what can be learned and what can be taken, what can be taken forward. And my final point is something that, uh, that's important for me to mention, although it's tangential to, to, this, uh, to, to this discussion, which is the, um, our, our colleagues of Arab um, business people and philanthropists from the Arab community that have been emerging, you know, they've been there for a long time, but, but in the past, I'd say, um, year, we, we've been developing stronger relationships and that's a very important leadership. And as part of the philanthropic community to have people that we're speaking to that are in a similar position on the giving side is, is something that's very valuable to, to the discussion. These are people that also, while they're giving to their community, they're also fighting for their businesses because, uh, as, as was mentioned, the business community is itself um, un, un, under attack, so to say, and, and it could be that you know, those of us that, that are from foundations or, or inherited wealth, we're dealing with that in a different way, but not as imminent as those that are today managing businesses. But it's very important for me as a philanthropic community to make sure that, that our circle is open to those that maybe today are, are very, very busy with imminent uh, needs that they need to address, but to make sure that we keep that communication, those communication lines open, because I think it's very valuable in the, um, in the discussion. Uh, Professor Daoud spoke about the in inclusion of people on the government level and in other decision-making processes, but also in the philanthropic networks we have these people and it's very important for us to continue those, those uh, connections. Great. So thank you very much, Adina. And now I'd like uh, to ask uh, Bacha Kalos, the director of, uh, the Israel director for the SVF to uh, provide us with our last comments. Thanks. Bacha. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. And welcome to all of you who are on the call. I also wanna wish um, the, um, all the Muslim observers, I want to wish you all a Ramadan Karim. 
uh, and I hope that this month goes well and brings you much joy and uh, family connection despite the limits because of the corona crisis. So I want to speak about the fact about what the corona crisis uh, demonstrated about the potential for philanthropy to be able to intervene in the field of Arab society. So as many of you know, and I know there are many of you on the call, the Social Venture Fund is a table for donors who want to uh, help to build the field of Jewish Arab equality in shared society and who see this as an opportunity to build the field, both for the field here in Israel, um, for Arab citizens, Arab society, Arab local authorities, the relations between the government and Arab citizens, and also as a, as a table or as a, a space for building the field um, among philanthropy. And I would say that in the same way that um, the needs emerged very early on and there was um, a sense among the civil society community about the need to collaborate and to cooperate and to understand that this corona crisis was bigger than what any single organization could possibly do to help intervene. I think the same thing occurred within the philanthropic community among those of us who are part of supporting Arab society. And uh, I saw something happen that, frankly, in the years that I've been involved in philanthropy, I've heard about but have never seen, which is literally a group of donors sitting together around a Zoom call saying, okay, who's up? Who's going to come forward with money? And really, within a week, the National Situation Room um, had sufficient funds to get off the ground and to be able to begin to operate. And um, as uh, Dr. Nahaya mentioned, among the first most crucial issues was this issue of coordination and integration to be able to be a first line response to the needs in Arab society at all levels. Um, this happened through the Situation Room and therefore through the um, existence of, bo of both the National Situation Room and the one in the negative, they were able to become an address for solving um, the immediate needs of the crisis. And um, I think for um, philanthropy, for the philanthropic community and for donors who care about this, this was a really, really important opportunity to learn how you can take what are numerous issues of inequality and within Arab society and begin to find ways to address those in very immediate, direct ways. And to, to begin to think, and I think now all of our speakers have mentioned this, that the question now is how to go forward and how to begin to address what will be the longer term implications of the corona crisis on the, on, on the economy, on the business community, um, on the health of, and uh, in the health in the community, in the Arab communities, and particularly how Arab local authorities are going to be able to stand up and become uh, institute, become the bodies which are able to help the uh, Arab citizens with emergency preparedness, with social resilience, um, being able to pull forward the funding and the resources that they need to be able to do that for their communities. And I think there's a real role for the philanthropic community in supporting municipal capacity building, supporting policy organizations that are um, working to affect uh, decision making and funding that's coming from the government, and for the local organizations which are providing models of ways of working which can then be built up and expanded and replicated in other areas uh, around the country. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, I really want to be as short as possible so you all have some time to, to ask questions. One of the things I want to mention is that um, as a professional working in this field, as a philanthropic professional, one of the things that I was asked to do by the Social Venture Fund was to assess how our grantees are coping with the corona crisis and how we can therefore explain how they have done that and um, together with a uh, consultant who we use in the Social Venture Fund, Dr. Jenny Cohen, we developed what we called the, the a model to assess the adaptive capacity of NGOs 
to be able to address the crisis and through it to, to find new solutions, new ways of working and new opportunities. And um, I'm happy to share the results of the, um, the work that we're doing. And one of the things that I really value about it is that it will provide us with a way of being able to aggregate um, not just at the individual level of the grantees, but also the way the field has emerged as a result of the corona crisis. So, um, and I think that will have some real value going forward. So I'm gonna stop here. Great, uh, thank you, Bacha. Um, this was, and thank you to all of the panelists. You know, unfortunately, the time has escaped and we're due to end at 2.45. So I'm going to pass it over to Ruud, who will take us out. Remember, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, thanks to all of you who attended and to all of you who presented. Ruud. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you for your uh, great moderating. Can we please have you to more webinars in the future? Um, I want to thank uh, Nihaya and Ahmed and Khir and Adina and Batya. Uh, I know how much time and effort you all uh, give uh, in this preparation, the preparation of this webinar. So thank you all so much. Uh, we invite you, um, whoever who attend this webinar, to reach out to Jeff and to SPF or to Task Force with any additional questions if you might have after this. Uh, webinar and please do write to us to Jeff and if you're interested in participating in a funder think tank uh, on this topic or if you want to connect with other funders who works in this field. Um, we have recorded this meeting and we, in the um, upcoming days we will upload it to our Jeff and uh, website and please note that uh, task force mapping on emergency response in Arab society is available for you on the Jeff and resource hub. Um, and will be posted um, on the SVF Facebook page as well. Um, I want to uh, deeply thank to Liron Shoham for her partnership and task force uh, for the work with the speakers um, and everything you did. Um, it's, we, we, Jeff, and really appreciate And for everything. the excellent paper, everybody should read really? it. Really? Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah. During the weekend, we ask everyone to, that's your read, the reading for the weekend. Um, and uh, more webinars to come um, from us uh, in JFN, so stay tuned and check our website. Um, thank you all for being with us, and we are looking forward to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I, I want to say thank you for the Social Venture Fund and uh, for Mubadarat, for uh, Ryan Foundation and Slivka Foundation. Many thanks for you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you and good night, everyone.